Again, it's good to be with you to uh, finish our study in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Invite your attention there. It's good to be back in our recording studios uh, in front of the light switch. And we pray that our time together tonight will be, will be beneficial uh, as we attempt to glorify God in this life. Before we begin tonight, let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful for Jesus and for the joy that he gives and, and for the instruction that he gives in his word to uh, enable us to do just that in this life. And Father, we pray that we will portray that joy to, uh, to a lost world. And Father, we pray that our study tonight will be beneficial and be encouraging. And Father, we pray that as we labor through this time of being apart, that uh, we, will, we will grow spiritually, that we will anticipate the time that we can be together. And Father, we pray for any of those that may be suffering or hurting uh, at this time, especially those of our congregation. We pray that uh, you would bless us as we uh, attempt to live for you. And Father, we pray that you would continue to forgive us and uplift us in the most holy faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I think of this great book of joy in these four chapters, we've, we've seen from chapter one that Christ is our life. In chapter two, uh, the Apostle Paul, as he was writing from that Roman prison, spoke of Christ as our example. In chapter three, Christ is our hope. And we looked at that hope in the form of a dream, the dream of God. And now tonight, we look at Christ being our support and our strength. And when, and when I look at these chapters and I think of chapter one being Christ as our life, I think of Christ coming to this life, being born of the Virgin Mary and, and leaving heaven and, and showing us what life is really all about. And then in chapter two, Christ is our example, we see him live out that sacrifice to live out that example. And then in chapter three, Christ is our dream and our hope. And when we think of the crucifixion and the resurrection, that is our hope. And then in the fourth chapter, Christ is our support and strength. Christ has given us his word in order to support our lives on this earth so that we can um, inevitably live with him throughout eternity. So I think of these four chapters as well uh, as it pertains to Jesus Christ in his birth, life, uh, crucifixion and resurrection, and uh, the supply and strength that he gives for us in this life. Let's look at, uh, at verse 1, and as we come into chapter 4, we get to the theme of the whole book. Remember, uh, chapter 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, a determined mind to say rejoice. And so Paul, as he's writing this from a Roman prison, is very well qualified to tell us about this. And so every point that we see here in chapter four, and really every point that we've made in the first three chapters, all point to verse four and rejoicing, whatever the situation, no matter what. Let's look beginning at verse one. I believe that verse one here really believe, uh, belongs back in chapter three. So many of the chapter divisions, verse divisions, um, uh, personally, and I'm sure we all think this way, we would not necessarily put them there. They're not inspired. But when, when Paul writes in, in chapter four, verse one, therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Well, he's just, he just got done uh, indicating to us how we stand fast. He just got done telling us that he's going to transform our lowly bodies into a body as his glorious body. He is telling us that our fellowship is in heaven. And verse one just seems more fittingly to go with chapter three. But when he, when he calls them his long four brethren, you know, Paul is very... Um, uh, very desirous of seeing his brethren no matter where he is when he writes different letters. Do you remember he said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, I long to see you, those that were in Rome. 
I long to see you that I can impart unto you some spiritual gift. He, he was always desiring to be with his brethren and to see his brethren. And so should we, especially when we endure times of separation. Uh, in Philippians chapter one, this very book that we're studying back uh, in verse eight of chapter one, he says, for God is my witness, how greatly I long to see you. And here in chapter four, he says it again. And, and, and so it is, if we're going to experience this joy that Paul is writing about, then that is seen in the desire we have to be with our brothers and sisters. And surely we can, we can understand that as, as we go through this uh, pandemic. But in, uh, in, in, verses, in verse one here, he says, therefore my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown. Now this word crown is very interesting. This translates a Greek word, Stephanos. If, uh, if your name is Stephen or know someone whose name is Stephen, their name means victory crown. Well, this isn't the only kind of crown that there is. There is also the diadema. That is the royal crown. Many times we sing the song, all hail the power of Jesus name. Bring forth the royal diadem or diadema in, in the Greek. That is the royal crown. But that's not, he doesn't use diadema here. He's using the word Stephanos, the victory crown. And what he's saying to uh, the Philippian brethren is that there, in remembrance of them, their faithful lives, the joy that their lives bring him, that is his victory. And in many cases in life, when we think we've enjoyed great victories, I wonder if this is one of them. The feeling that we have for our brethren who are faithful in Christ. They are our victory crown. That's what Paul is saying. But he's saying, since that is the case, so, an adverb of manner, stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord. In other words, don't fall away. There is the possibility of falling away. He says, stand fast, hold fast. Hold fast to the gospel. Stand firm in the truth. And then there seems to be the division, which I believe should be the, the beginning of chapter four, when he is speaking of two women. And they were having a disagreement. This is the only problem, which I think is very interesting, in this whole book. When he is writing this thank you note, as it were, for all that uh, the Philippian church meant to him, he mentions this one thing. And I don't know if it's a significant thing or not that they were women, um, not necessarily, but there was this problem of disunity. And you can find that as a theme in every book, at least uh, I'm mentioning here, uh, in every book that the apostle wrote. 1 Corinthians 1, it began by talking about unity and what was causing, how, how denominational ideas were causing disunity. And here in this chapter, there was a personal uh, disagreement between Euodia and Syntyche. And notice what he says in verse 2, I implore Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind. Where? In the Lord. In the Lord. Well, back in chapter 2 and verse 2 of this book, Paul says, fulfill my joy, be like-minded. And that's what he's encouraging these two ladies that had the disagreement, to be of the same mind, to be like-minded in order to fulfill the apostle's joy. You know, it robs from joy when there is disunity, when there is disagreement, but not just disagreement. I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit understood, understood that there was going to be disagreement, but that disagreement should not lead to a disunity. Now, there is a difference. And Paul says, help them, encourage them. He says in verse three, and I urge you also, true companion. Now, I've got a question here. 
I've got a question. In this first point of how we're able to rejoice in all situations, always, there must be an understanding and a desire for unity. We are to, uh, uh, to endeavor to have the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And here, Paul is talking to a true companion. Who is this true companion? I urge you also, verse 3, true companion, help these women. Well, it's interesting, the Greek word here is syzygous, S-Y-Z-Y-G-U-S, syzygous. Now, this word is also, in the Greek language, a proper noun. And so, the translators translated this word, but as you know, as we know, in Bible times, Names of people mean something. You know, for a example, Paul would use uh, the name Onesimus when he wrote to Philemon, and, and there was a man named Onesimus. Now, his name had a particular meaning, but here the particular uh, meaning of this word is what is translated instead of the proper noun. Now, the proper noun seems to fit the context more because he is speaking, as he's writing to the church, he is speaking to a true companion here. And so it's probably a, a, a person by the name of Sezygus. But be that as it may, he's saying, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also. Many believe this Clement to be uh, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, later on in uh, that was mentioned in the book of Revelation and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now notice who he considers, the apostle Paul considers to be in the book of life. It's all the people that were just mentioned, even the two ladies, Eodius and Syntyche, who had the disagreement. So this ought to tell us that when we have disagreements, but they don't cross the line into a sinful situation, perhaps, or a situation that would cause us to be lost, our names are still not deleted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, which basically this book and, and this Lamb's Book of Life, the Book of Life is mentioned at least four times in the book of Revelation. It's the roster of the saved. If you are part of God's elect and you are saved at this time, then your name is in the book of life. But it's interesting to note from the book of Revelation, that name can be taken out of the book of life, which indicates that we could be lost and is further indicated here by Paul telling the brethren to fulfill his joy, to stand fast in the faith. And they needed to take heed lest they, lest they would fall. But he goes on to say, and here's our theme, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, after the point of being united brings this joy, look what else does in verse 5. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Gentleness. The idea here is graciousness. You see, the fact that we've been saved by grace, we should have a gracious nature about us, a forgiving nature, desiring of extending grace. And that's what this idea, this word gentleness means. But in order to have this kind of grace, in order to rejoice in the Lord always, we have to have a certain degree of trust in the Lord. You know, if I'm going to rejoice, even when times are troublesome, I'm going to have to trust the Lord to do it through those times. If I'm going to be gracious when I need to be, I'm going to have to have a degree of trust in the Lord. And, and I want to suggest to us that if the Lord could say to Peter, 
when his life was in peril. You remember in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 31, when Jesus said to Peter, O oh, you of little faith. You know, well, think about it. Put yourself in that situation. If you were drowning in the Sea of Galilee, would you be worried about your life? Surely the Lord must look on us with even greater disfavor when we don't trust him and we allow ourselves to be troubled and to worry constantly over even the most trivial of things in this life. Don't be a worry wart. Don't be one that is always worried about the things that this life brings. It's not going to last long. And if Jesus could look at Peter in the face of death and tell Peter, oh, you of little faith, what about the things that we worry about? I wonder what the Lord would say to us. As faith increases, is this not a theme of the Bible? As faith increases, worry should decrease. The more I put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, the less I should worry about the things in this life. John says in his first epistle, chapter four and verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. Well, trust is rooted in love. Perfect trust then will cast out fear. And here in this passage, Paul says, the Lord is at hand. That's one reason why I should put away fear. The Lord's here. That's why Peter should have put away fear. When he was drowning in Galilee, the Lord was right there. You see, where do our priorities lie? Well, then beginning at verse six, here is the next ingredient for us to be able to rejoice always. Notice this, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, this will result, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you believe that God is in control, what are you worried about? What is it? Can peril or famine or sword, what can separate us from the love of Christ? The same apostle writes, casting all your fear upon him. He knows the falling of each sparrow. If that concerns him, how much more is he caring about you? And here's the phrase again. Oh, you of little faith. Be anxious for some things? No, be anxious for nothing. How do we take care of that? By prayer and intense prayer. By prayer and supplication. Let your troubles, let your victories, let it all be made known unto God. And then the peace of God comes. And this peace cannot be explained by worldly standards. You know, sometimes I hear men pray in public, Lord, uh, uh, give us peace or give us comfort as only, what do we say? As only you know how. And you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Because this kind of peace comes in a way that passes worldly understanding. And this kind of peace, based on trust, based on love, which is, allows us to rejoice and stand fast, this kind of peace will guard your heart. It will not only guard your heart, it will guard your mind. It's the same thing. It's your spirit. If you want to be spiritual, then allow your spirit to think this way. All right, then he comes into verse eight. And this is a very, very, uh, interesting passage, this, just this one verse. 
and there are so many things, that six things in it, actually, again, that relates to how we find this uh, deep down joy that the Lord wants us to have in this, in this life. Notice what he says. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest or noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praise, anything praiseworthy, then think, the New King James here says, meditate on these things. Oh, it is so important to imbibe into our spirits these things. You want to know why joy is not there? Do you want to know why peace is lacking many times? We have to exercise our spirits, our minds, to think on these things. It's amazing. One of the great blessings that God has given us is our mind that can make a choice. One of the most dangerous things that God has given us is a mind to make a choice. Because there is the possibility of a bad choice. But he's saying, if we have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 5, if we think on these things, Philippians 4, 8, then we don't have to worry about bad decisions because all of the situations in life that we encounter, we pass through the grid of God's word that we have hidden in our hearts or that we study to keep us from Satan so that we can ward off the fiery darts that he throws. But it's important that we begin all of this where everything begins in the mind. It's our thought life. Mark Twain wrote this. What a wee little part of a person's life are his acts and his words. Hmm. His real life is led in his head and is known to no one but himself. All day long, the mill of his mind is grinding, and his thoughts, not the other things, are his history. I would suggest those are his makeup. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Mark Twain was right, but he was right because that's what the Word of God says. Our makeup is on the inside first. The most important part of us cannot be seen. It is our spirit. It is our soul. That is who we are. And we are with that spirit or soul, whether or not anybody else is around, whether we're in public or in private. It's our thought life, whether in public or private. And that's why prayer is so important. That's why we need to make all these things known by prayer and supplication, intense prayer. Because we're forming, we're exercising our thought life. And Mark Twain even understood that's the, that's the basic part of man. That's who man really is. Our thought life forms the basis of our actions and our words. You want the actions to be right and the words to be right? Then the thought life must be right. You know why the actions aren't right? You know why there are addictions? You know why there are bad choices? Because before that addiction started, we weren't thinking right. And as the addiction continues, in order to be freed from that, our thought life has to get right. But many times the thought life is, I'm not ready to give it up. I'm not ready to make a change. You see... The Lord said that we must have the mind, his mind, in order for us to be, to have this joy that, uh, that we're looking for. Jonathan Edwards put it this way. The ideas and the images in a person's mind are the invisible powers that constantly govern him. And that's exactly what the Lord said. So it is crucial, crucial for each of us to bring our thought life into submission to Jesus Christ. 
You can't do right and think wrong. It begins with the heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to us here in verse 8 of chapter 4. And one of the most helpful things that we can learn about the Christian life is that sin begins in our thoughts. The Bible calls it the heart. Jesus says that which proceeds out of a man is what defiles the man. From within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts and fornications and thefts and murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit and so many sins that we read about in the Word of God. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. No one commits sin without first having committed them. Committed them first in the mind and then committing an overt act. If we want to grow in godliness, then we must win the battle at the thought level, at the mind level. And that's what Paul is saying in this whole book of Philippians in order to engender joy. We've got to think right. We've got to think right to do the good and we must think right to avoid the evil. Paul exhorting us here in verse 8, develop the Christian thought life. And so our words will not be divorced from our thoughts. Practicing verse 8 here is essential. I believe that this is one of the most essential verses in all of the Word of God. Those that deal with how to think. A Christian's thought life is also integral to this life of joy. And so we've come full circle now in these four chapters. We see Paul being put in prison, and we see how this joy is coming. And in this last chapter of Christ being our strength and support, he's telling us how to think. Clearly, Paul's thought life was at the heart of his contentment. When he will say later on in the, in the chapter, in verse 11, I have, watch this, circle it, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. It's a learned thing. It won't come naturally. We must develop it, just like learning anything else. But it's like riding a bike. Once you got it, once you learn how to do it, you don't forget how to do it. You just keep putting those valuable things from the Word of God in your mind, and you will rejoice. No matter if you're incarcerated, no matter what the situation might be in life. And you won't worry. You'll trust in the Lord. And the Lord won't have to say of you like he said to Peter on one occasion, Oh, you of little faith. But I want to look here before we, before we close what Paul is not saying. And this is so important, beloved, because of what is so commonly taught in the religious world. We need to focus for a moment here because... The, the religious world has been infiltrated with a doctrine that is not true, but it's very popular. And that doctrine is the, uh, the teaching of positive thinking. Now, let me, let me explain this a little bit. It's good to think positively. God wants us to think positively. But you know, so many times good words are taken and they are used to destructive means. I mean, just about every word of the Bible has, has been used that way. How is love used? Is love ever taken out of context of the Bible? Oh, all the time. What about faith? What about grace? Yeah, uh, the idea of being saved uh, by faith apart from any response. Faith has been mutilated by the religious world. You know, positive thinking has been as well. E evangelism. You know, we all know that evangelism is a principle that's taught in the Bible. We all, in a general sense, are to be evangelists. But the teaching that is such uh, 
a, a foundational part of evangelicalism is contrary to the word of God. And you know, Satan has used the power of positive thinking that way. And you know what he's done? He's, he's convinced a lot of, of, of our brethren to think that there shouldn't be a lot negative taught. It should all be the power of positive thinking. In fact, many evangelical principle uh, preachers, that's the principle of their preaching, Joel Osteen and others. In fact, he made, um, he, he made the statement on an occasion, I, I heard him, it was a while ago, that uh, he was only going to preach things that are positive. Can you imagine any preacher of the New Testament agreeing with that idea? The power of positive thinking. Well, this was, at least for um, evangelicalism's purposes, popularized by an author by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Do you remember him? And uh, with some slight variations, Peale's protege, Robert Schuller, uh, who has been accepted in evangelical circles, uh, Preach this doctrine uh, almost exclusively. And really what they teach is not Christian in any, ortho, in any, in any orthodox way. Uh, they both have been welcomed into pulpits of, of the evangelicals and through their influence, this idea has crept into many religious groups and has even infiltrated the Lord's church. That it's ever, that, it, that, it's, that it's not right to be critical or to be negative. And, and this teaching has resulted in a loss of discernment. It has lost and it has contradicted many scriptures like trying the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. And instead of doing things like this, it has led to our atmosphere in our time of whateverism. You just think positively. You know, it is even, it is even influenced the idea of repenting. Do you know why people aren't repenting anymore? Is because you're not allowed to think negative thoughts. You know, it has to be the power of positive thinking, even to the point where some of the founders of, uh, of some of the religious denominations have come up with this idea that if you think positively enough, then God is basically bound to grant that. The positive thinking heresy has further been spread through the so-called positive confession. Uh, the idea of health and wealth. The, uh, it's been called name it and claim it. If it makes you feel good, do it. Claim it. Claim it is yours. Pray about it. Don't worry about this thing called sin or... Now, that usually won't be uh, verbalized because... That idea is, is dealt with so frequently in Scripture. But whatever you confess, confess it pos, uh, positively by faith, and then God is bound to do it. This heresy attributes power to faith alone. You know, you talk about, can we be saved by faith alone? No, we can't. And you can't repent by faith alone either. You can't attribute God's power, God's forgiveness or his salvation to faith alone. And the result of this idea is this teaching. If you are sick, don't be negative at all. Confess it positively. And by confessing it, or asking for healing positively, you convince yourself that you are well. You know, the Christian science religion began this way. The fact that there are people that won't take blood transfusions, and, and not just because they have decided that it's just not best, they believe it's, it's, it's wrong in the eyes of God to do it. That there is no medicine to be taken at, at, at all, and... Um, and, and many of their own people have died because of that. Because it's all reflected in this 
power of positive thinking. And it is applied to so many areas of life and to where, think about it a minute. Can you imagine how many scriptures are contradicted by this doctrine of the power of positive thinking? Now, we are to think good thoughts. In fact, in this very verse that we're going to talk about, I mean, whatsoever things are what? True. That's a positive thought. Whatsoever things are honest, that's a positive thought. Whatsoever things are pure and lovely and just. You know, basically those are positive thoughts. But that is not teaching the doctrine of the power of positive thinking applied to every situation everywhere and for all time. In fact, that is just not biblical. What Paul is teaching here is that one's thought life should be the focus of every great spiritual truth, whether we see them as positive or negative. You know, in order for the prodigal son to come back and enjoy the blessings of his father's house and his environment, he had to realize where he was. And you know, that thought wasn't real positive. He could not convince himself positively that he was in a good situation. There had to be struggle. There had to be sorrow. There had to be happiness taken away. But with the thought, with the positive thought of, hey, I can be forgiven of my father, then those things that brought about sad thoughts could be done away with. But that doesn't mean all sad thoughts in the rest of his life would be done away with because he tried to eradicate them all with the power of positive thinking. No, when Paul would try the spirits, when Paul would have to deal with false teaching, when Paul would have to repent even in his own life, there had to be some negativity there. In fact, when we think of the greatest love act there ever was, the death of Christ, guess what we have to think about in that? What put him on that cross? Not only at that time, but my sins put him there. But the, the idea is God's gospel does not end at the cross. The real power of positive thinking is picking up our crosses daily, which might not always be a happy thing. It might not uh, require less than sacrifice. But the power is in the gospel in how to overcome in order to, to have ultimate happiness. Listen, nothing that we know in life brings great joy without some kind of uh, negative aspect. What must I do in order to gain this goal? whether it's studying through school, whether, no matter what it is. This idea of taking everything negative out of one's mind, you'd have to subtract half of the word of God. That is not what this teaches. And an acceptance of Peel's philosophy, which does not belong in the gospel, has led to what we now know as basic, basically love God, he loves you, both positive thoughts, and then do whatever you please. And the plan of salvation doesn't matter anymore. You, you, there's no worry about working out your own salvation anymore because you see man views those thoughts as negative. And so those aren't to be in his mind. No, positive thinking from God's word comes through how to handle the negative, which will inevitably come into every, every life. In every life, a little rain must fall. But we know how to handle the rain. We know what our umbrella makeup is supposed to be. And that's what Philippians 4.8 is. It's an umbrella verse. But it's a very fundamental and foundational verse. And one that is so important to study. And ladies and gentlemen, Lord willing, we will do that next time as we continue and conclude our study of this great book. What an important book it is. I hope you've been seeing that through our time together. And I look forward next time to delving into each one of these six traits 
of how to rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And I hope that you have applied the things that we've studied so far into your life, into this time of imprisonment to really realize the will of God for you in life. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you soon.